seminars are pre uh, presented as part of this symposium. Today's lecture is from IHF analyst and head coach of the U younger age category national teams of the German Handball Federation, Jochen Beppler, and national athletic coach for the German national teams, David Grogo. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the lecture. We will stop a few times to answer some questions. And please also note this lecture is being recorded so you will be able to access it later for on-demand viewing. And so Jochen, we are ready for you to begin, David. Thank you so much, Courtney, for introducing us. And yeah, David will introduce himself later on. Uh, yeah, thanks again for introducing us to this uh, session, which is called Restart of Preparation in a Special Situation within uh, the IHF Virtual Academy. Um, we have provided the following schedule for you, and you can see how we're going to proceed. We have prepared three parts parts in which each of us, David and me, will contribute uh, some ideas before you have the chance in the fourth part to ask questions, but you will also have questions, uh, you will also have the possibility to ask questions after first, second and third part, because we will have a short break in between. Um, Roughly spoken, you could also say that uh, we have divided our talk into the three parts uh, past, which was March 2020 with the lockdown situation, the present situation like June and July, uh, at least in Europe, we are about to return to play. And there are special thoughts connected to this question and the third part uh, dealing mostly with the future and some additional supporting ideas um, to support this return to play. So let's um, dip into the first part, which deals with the lockdown in March 2020 and the question arising, what to do now? Uh, first of all, uh, I think you all can remember the situation in March 2020 when from uh, one day to another priorities were different and there were many things more important than sports in March 2020. It was a very complex situation with uh, many comparisons. What are other countries doing at the moment? What is their situation like? And we also discussed in the Federation the question, what could we do in order to support the handball community, the handball society? And um, our result was that we did not want to do things for just for the sake of doing things. But uh, we as others had to improvise in this situation that our aim was to have a well thought out improvisation um, in this situation. So what should we consider or what sh should you consider when thinking about how the Federation could support the handball society? And the first and for us most important thing was um, being aware of the fact that the Federation is not only uh, responsible for the national or elite players, but also and most of all for the clubs and the non-professional players to support uh, the whole handball community. The second thing we got aware of is that we said we are not only responsible for the players during their time um, when they are with a national team or when they are wearing our shirts and dresses, but we are also responsible for them uh, when they have this situation where they are not able to train. So three questions arose for us. How could we take care for the players? How could we stay in touch with them? And what could we do in order to set new goals for the future? Because uh, all the competitions uh, were away in this part. So our first step was to develop alternatives to their normal practice. So, and uh, we thought about uh, how could a return to activity look like under those special circumstances? What could we do to keep the players stay in motion, which was our main goal at um, the beginning? Um, at this time in March 2020, some words all beginning with self gained greater importance for the players, which were self-responsibility, self-discipline and self-motivation because they could not get direct uh, support by us. But it was also uh, the task for the Federation, how could we support the players? And our first step was supporting them with uh, videos. We call them fit with DHB, we make strong. 
And we supported them with video clips with different content, different location, and different actors like professional players or non-professional players. And what I, what I could say at the very beginning, we received most, most feedback and the greatest traffic for the videos with children uh, practicing in the living room on the porch or in the courtyard. And if you are interested looking at those videos, you could have a look at YouTube and search for DHB Wir Machen Stark and you can find um, approximately 20 videos with all the clips we provided. And at this stage, um, we want to show you a short best of clip so that you get an impression what we did in order to support our players um, when the lockdown arose. Damit euch zu Hause nicht allzu langweilig wird, habe ich euch ein kleines Workout zusammengestellt, wie man seine Sprungkraft erhalten kann. Hallo ihr Lieben, ich bin's Alicia und ich zeige euch heute ein paar Übungen, die ich momentan zu Hause mache. Ja, hallo an alle da draußen. Ich hoffe erstmal, in dieser schwierigen Situation geht es euch allen gesundheitlich gut. Hier sind die National Players Obst, Reichmann und Scholle. Now you get an effect of training a different location. Improvising the material. Yeah, this was a short impression of the clips we did in March and April. And uh, we received a lot of appreciation by coaches, parents, and the kids, uh, especially with the uh, clips for children. And um, yesterday, the latest video was published dealing with the return to play and return to handball. And uh, you will see many of uh, the impressions as well in, in today's presentation. But this latest video was published yesterday. You will also find it on, you can also find it on YouTube. So this was the first step, um, helping the players to stay in motion. And the sec second step for us as Federation and the national coaches was keeping in touch with the players. And this taking care and taking over responsible responsibility for the players is mostly about having personal contact, which was not possible in uh, those days. Um, but we wanted to show the players that they are not only interesting for us if they wear our dress or shirt, um, but we are also taking care of them when they have difficulties to manage or obstacles in their way. So for a period of six weeks, we introduced uh, so-called virtual national camps. Uh, this was in the period of April uh, and May mainly. And uh, our national coaches invited the players every week for 60 uh, to 75 minutes. Every week the players received an invitation from the office like they normally uh, do when we have normal uh, training camps. And so they received 
um, a weekly invitation to those virtual camps. They were asked to take part in team equipment and we provided different contents like team building activities, theory talks on nutrition or psychology. Um, they got a personal assistance in their return to play situation as we have different regions in Germany and all the different regions had different restrictions at uh, different times. So this was uh, really crazy sometimes. And they also got tactic clinics uh, where they were taught in uh, yeah, special things of defense or offense. We also tried to uh, reach an interaction with the players like with apps or, or programs like Mentimeter, Kahoot, or we provided group work. Here you have an impression how those uh, camps look like and um, our national coaches did really good in uh, keeping in touch with the players in those days. At the same time, maybe just with a delay of three or four weeks, another question arose for our specialists in the Federation like David. And so I'm pre preparing his first part in our talk now. And they had to deal with the question how to prepare everyone for the return to handball, for their return to the court and for the return to handball specific loads. And uh, as you might remember from my first presentation in this virtual academy, I uh, told you that I like handball the most of all sports, but I'm also interested in the relatedness to other uh, sports. And I was reminded of a book called Ice Hockey Performance. Maybe you are interested in that. I, I really love it because you can learn a lot as a handball coach from other uh, sports as well. And this book was published by Gerrit Käferstein and he deals with a so-called win pyramid uh, where he does not use the word win, win in its original sense, which is being successful. But he uses this win as an abbreviation for the question, what is important now? And I think as most of the coaches and me too are responsible for younger age players, it, we have to ask ourselves, um, should we make the players ready for Saturday, which is competition weekly, 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 and just about winning, or should we make them ready for their career? And there was a strong parallel in this Corona uh, situation that we should take care for the players uh, and make them ready for their career. So long-term player development is really important. And here you can see this uh, pyramid by uh, Käferstein. If you only deal with the last three steps at the top, which is only about play, then you might win uh, matches on Saturday. But if you miss to deal with the uh, steps, fuel, move and perform, you lack or you miss making them ready for their career. Because there's a difference, as Mr. Norris says, it's a different difference what it takes to become a champion um, and to the situation what it needs to be a champion. So this preparation was really important and we have the specialists in our um, federation uh, who dealt with the question. And another quote from uh, James Kerr in his book about that famous rugby team, the All Blacks, um, that the way the sapling is shaped determines how the tree grows. And uh, that is the, the point where I want to pass the floor to David, uh, who might introduce the thoughts he and his colleagues made, how we should prepare the, uh, the, the players return to the court. So David, it's your turn now. Yeah, thank you, Jochen. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to say hello to everyone and share my slides. Uh, just a second, please. All right. So, um, yeah, we are still in the, in the past. And uh, if we want to prepare a return, a return to whatever, a return to play, to, to activity or even to handball, that's that's the goal to, to uh, prepare a return to handball. Uh, we need to know uh, where we are, where we are at now. So we did a analyzing, uh, analyzing of the here and now. Um, yeah, and uh, what, what we saw uh, is that we have now a situation of 10 weeks or more uh, with no specific training. Um, in the beginning, it, it was a relief for many players. Maybe um, they had time to regenerate, to heal minor problems or injuries. 
Um, yeah, but then uncertainty follows. Um, they didn't know how to train or how to or what to train for. Um, should they maintain or intensify or just regenerate? And uh, yeah, they, they had no clear goal. Um, then the next issue was we have a decline of training volume by 80 to 85 percent or up to 100 percent in the amateur sector. Uh, we know that because we did a questionnaire uh, in the clubs. Um, yet the, the decline in training volumes was so immense. Um, we had to fear of um, loose specific conditions, neuromuscular conditioning uh, conditions, um, and even a regression of, of muscle mass and, and uh, stiffness of tendons and so on. So it was also a big issue. But um, of course, uh, our athletes, our players did something, um, but it was predominantly strength and endurance training. Yeah, and, and this is not handball training. So even the players, uh, even when the players feel fitter than ever, um, we shouldn't get fooled by that because the uh, general fitness rises up, but it was general and not specific to handball. So keep that in mind. Um, then the next issue was uh, we were facing a um, double worst case scenario. So we will um, come back to that also later, but uh, I will um, explain what, what it means. So we are first, um, uh, worst case scenario is that uh, training state of the players, uh, which has been greatly reduced by the corona pandemic. And the second is um, the high demands of the coming season uh, due to the increased game schedule in the leagues. Um, because of the no rele uh, relegation rule due to the early stop of the league in, in Germany. So we have more teams and more games the next season. Um, but even with all these issues, there's a ray of hope in the situation. Um, we never had so much time to prepare. So yeah, let's use it wisely. And when we prepare, um, the return to play, we have to keep some things in mind uh, and we have to face uh, different situations. So the first was uh, that we are facing different conditions in each state here in Germany. So how to handle with that? The next one was that we should be aware of the demands of handball in, in terms of uh, loads and forces. And um, then we should have a plan for progressive increase in loads and reducing injury risk. So therefore we, we did some scientific research and had scientific thoughts. And one of the results was a pre-preparation. And I'm gonna show you in the next slides, uh, this topic. So for the first one, um, yeah, let's, let's look how we try to solve the limitations. Um, we have created an eight-step plan that helps us find the right shape for the training. Um, these points are detailed with, with examples in our return to play article uh, that you will find uh, in an address I, I will show you later. Uh, but uh, let's just have a quick look uh, at the at points, at the dots, uh, and the red dots um, are showing how to train or what training is possible um, in this case or in this situation and it's almost with no contact to others. The yellow dots show uh, training from small groups to teams uh, without duels and black uh, is team training or competition or black and white is team training and competition with or without audience. All right, let's move to the next topic uh, that I showed you before, the loads the specific loads and forces that uh, we are exposed to in, in handball. So, and what should we expect when we get back to handball training? Um, so during sprinting, uh, we have uh, four and a half time our body weight. Uh, and uh, if you multiply your weight with four and a half, you know how much this is. And it's on one leg, of course. So when you're sprinting, uh, you don't, standing with both legs on, on the ground. Um, it's even more when you have cuts and change of directions. Um, same with, uh, with um, jumping and landings. 
So um, during landings, you, you will have peak forces of uh, seven times your body weight. So this is really a lot. You, can, you cannot uh, imitate that with, with uh, any kind of, of strength training. So um, let's look at the forces in the shoulders. Uh, we have tensile forces uh, up to 950 Newton. That's about a ton. So this is from a, from a study in baseball, but even if you cut it a half for handball, we have also a half ton, a half ton for your shoulder girdle. This is really a lot uh, of tensile forces, which we are exposed to. And it's really uh, almost impossible to, to imitate that with, with some uh, strength exercises. So we need this special uh, handball specific training and handball specific loads uh, and forces. So then we'll move on to volume. Um, we have over 84,000 uh, or 48,000 throws uh, in a season. That's uh, almost 10, uh, that's almost, sorry, 1,000 throws per week. So, and then we have up to 20 hours of training in a week, and it sounds a lot, but in a, in a preparation, in a normal preparation, this uh, is really realistic. So the, the player's body is normally adapted to, to all of that, but if you don't use it, you lose it. So with strength, strength training, for example, we just can try to slow down uh, regression, but we cannot replace. So in the next slide are the scientific thoughts that we did on return to competition. Um, there is, uh, in, is including the double worst case scenario. Uh, we spoke out important core messages for training practice and as a, re and as a result of, um, of this one, the importance of a pre-preparation uh, was uh, spoken out. Um, we brought it into the leagues. We discussed it with them and uh, received really positive feedback and this shows us um, that there was a need for a clear line at that point. So this is also accessible for everyone on dhb.de's um, yeah, return to play. There you will also find um, what I mentioned before. So and now we have a look at the last slide here. This is the pre-preparation. It was a kind of result of the scientific thoughts. Uh, the pre-preparation here is, is the best case, is a controlled uh, and stepwise increase of loads in a period or a time of five to seven weeks. So the target is um, just building up a, a good load tolerance to start the preparation without impairments from the lockdown. So um, as you see, you have uh, the red line is the, the chronic load tolerance and we wanna bring it up to have a better starting position when you, uh, when you go into the normal uh, preparation. And uh, in the best case, you are slightly over that loads that you have uh, displayed in the, in the last column. Uh, this will be um, immediately before the leak starts. So yes, thank you up to now. And before I start with the second part, um, you can ask questions now. I pass the floor to Courtney then. Uh, David, can you talk a bit more about the mechanical loads and why these are important? All right, uh, so mechanical loads, you know, um, we have loads, for example, in the gym, um, so it, it, it might be or it might feel very heavy, but it's not comparable to that specific uh, loads that you have when you are uh, standing on the, on the court and these mechanical loads, it loads that you, your, um, your body has to, to tolerate and to adapt to. Um, they are, yeah, they're very important in, in, in that time when you don't play handball, you lose a certain, um, tension, you lose uh, certain adaptions that you did to this specific mechanical loads. And you cannot uh, replace that with, with, uh, with 
uh, strength training or with, with other forms of training. It's, it's really specific to that, what you're doing on the court. Okay, uh, we don't actually have any other questions so far, guys. So you can uh, continue if you'd like. All right. So then we move on uh, to the second part. Uh, now we are moving also on to the present. So, and um, when we are talking about preparing, uh, of course, it's, it's all about preparing for handball. So an athletic preparation should focus on the, on the main movements like sprint, jump and throws in, in all variations. And uh, we also need sensible progressions uh, like closed drills to open drills. What that means, you will, will see later in the video examples, in the exercise examples on the videos. Um, we need a progression from the controlled movement to a situational reactive movement. We need progressions from low load to high load. And um, if our goal is to reduce injury risk, we, we got to prepare for the unpredictable. We got to prepare for chaos. So uh, I, I think this this picture is a really good example. Uh, he jumps, he gets a push while um, while jumping, and you don't know what's next. So it's chaotic. So this is what we have to prepare for. Um, so then let's have a look what what we can do for preparing and uh, preparing specific handball loads and reducing injury risk. All right. So I hope everything works good with the video. Um, okay, we start with uh, reducing injury risks. Um, most, uh, most of these exercises are aimed at critical points to uh, prepare for the movement that, that follows later. So we see here she's doing YTWs, very static uh, exercise, bringing tanger, tension in the shoulder blades. This is a little bit more dynamic. You see for all exercises, you, you don't need uh, big equipment or even no equipment and you can do it in the gym, in the court. All right, they are doing shrugs. This is for uh, activating the, um, the neck muscles. These are also involved in the, in the throwing movement. Here is a exercise for the shoulder blades, also to bring pre-tension into the shoulder blades. All right, this is a really nice exercise for stabilizing, uh, stabilizing the shoulder. Um, he's resisting against perturbation in different positions. All right, now it's more the trunk and core because this is the connection between the upper and the lower body. So very important to, to have a good pre-activation in this uh, section of the, of the body. So she's kneeling this little bit more demanding with the hands overhead. She has her eyes closed and gets uh, tension from all sides and has to resist all right, and now she's staying in a, in a specific stance. You can play with that. You can bring your players in any stance you, you want and then bring tension on the band. So this is more uh, for the leg axis. It's a very controlled movement now. You shift your weight from one leg to the other and extend the leg, bringing tension in your glutes and in the quads. And now we move on to a more dynamic movement quick downs or drop downs. Um, the band is, is uh, pulling the knees together and the players um, should resist against collapsing to the inside with the knees. And now we do it with one leg. This is quite more demanding. You see the knee wants to collapse to the inside and he has got to resist against that. Really good exercise for the knee. Uh, sneeze stabilizing or uh, leg axis stability. And these are just a few examples of, of activation uh, at critical points. Um, so we move on now to the other parts. Wait, okay. Before we move on, uh, I just want to quick show you this slide. Um, this is how to set up for progressions. This is a sensible uh, um, setup. 
and it's adapted from from Ian Jeffries, um, Ian Jeffries game speed, if you're interested in that. Um, this is a typical progression from a closed to open drill training program. And um, yeah, by the end, we SNC coaches or athletic coaches bring it up to a certain point, but then um, the, the head coaches add the perceptual cognitive training. So in other words, the handball specific training. This is not a, um, our job as athletic coaches. We have to prepare that and we have to, to take in mind that uh, the progression is senseful and, and goes up this way, what we're showing here on this slide. So let's have a look at the video examples. We start with, with running and change of direction and the progressions. So. This is just uh, linear running, linear running from a, a falling start. She's running through wickets that have a more distance as further she goes. This is her forcing her to, to move on quicker. This is uh, with constraints, running with constraints. This is uh, more demanding from a coordinative uh, aspect. Here they are stopping, backpedaling. everything with resistance. These are uh, planned and controlled movements. These are closed drills. The player's focus of attention is on the, on the execution of the movement pattern. This is more specific, but even closed drill. So, yeah, you see, how much forces she's now absorbing when she stops, bam. And she cannot use her arms or hands because she's holding the ball. This is, again, uh, running with constraints. Still close drills and now we go to open drills. He doesn't know before where he should run to. This is a mirror drill. Now, when we progress to open or chaotic drills, the focus of attention turns to the task. Uh, the chosen movements will, will be dependent on the stimulus the player uh, was given. You see that it is quite demanding, stopping, running, stopping, running, and this is the highest form, this is very sport specific, and now uh, Bam, he breaks through. Good job. Okay, so this was uh, running and change of direction based, the progressions. Um, now we move on to jumping. Right, we, we started with uh, very simple vertical jumping on a box. You have uh, less impact um, than landings from a almost 30 centimeter high box. Now jumping with one leg and landing with both, jumping from the box and landing properly. You know, uh, a big part is mainly about landing and force absor absorption uh, when you train or prepare jumps. Now jumps over a hurdle and activating through reactive jumps so both legs and now we move on to single leg is more demanding here is the target to control the landings again now lateral quality over quantity it's better to do less jumps but really high quality then do too much and get fatigued. So now we have more reactive. This is really demanding. Medial jumps over a hurdle, one leg. So this is also good to stabilize the, the leg axis. So now reactive small jumps over a rope. It's good for stabilizing the ankle also and to keep ground contact short and reactive. And now we are 
preparing for the unpredictable, for chaos. What I told before, he gets a push. He has his eyes closed. First, he uh, was allowed to land on both legs. Now he lands on one leg. This is, uh, it looks easy, but it's quite demanding when you don't know where the push comes from. And at the end, again, sport specific, you jump, you land, you shift to the side. This is more sport specific. Again, just a few samples, but uh, I hope the message is clear of, uh, of the progression in that. So now we move on to throwing. Right, so this is just uh, using the, the total range of motion. This guy here in the front, he has a weight ball, which was one and a half kilo. And now we do external rotation and the internal rotation, the eccentric phase of the internal rotation was really controlled and slow. Same with the long lever, controlling the eccentric phase. Now reactive drop and catch with the short lever, drop and catch with the long lever. You know, here on all these exercises, the focus is on, on the uh, eccentric um, internal rotation with the long or short lever. Also here is all about decelerating. That's really important uh, because the body will not accelerate the arm faster than it can decelerate it. So uh, the, and the high, highest forces um, were measured when you um, throw the ball. So in the, in the last, last um, moment when you release the ball. So and then you have to, to slow down your arm. And if it's not prepared well, then you will get injured. So now we, we saw before concentric uh, throws and now we're bringing it together with a counter movement, short lever, and then when, throw with the counter movement, long lever. He's kneeling because you can isolate the movement better. So it's everything about preparing the throws. Of course, uh, the sports or the handball specific throw, uh, you do it with, with steps or uh, you're moving the whole body. Here we want to, to isolate it more that you have a little bit more demands on, on, the, on the shoulder and be better prepared for that. So, all right, um, we saw some, some examples for the progression, but I want you to keep in mind that handball, as mentioned before, cannot be replaced, but it can be well prepared. So to avoid injury risk, it's, it's very important that you don't have a sudden increase in load. So raise volume, intensity, and complexity stepwise. Then, um, yeah, good regeneration between training sessions is still, and I say it again, is still important. Uh, you know, adaption happens when you regenerate. We don't have to catch up the lockdown phase with more or more intense training. So in the last one, quality over quantity, especially now in the, in the preparation or in the pre-preparation. Do less, very good, then much bad. So thank you so far. Um, and I will pass the floor to Jochen at this point. Thank you, David. Yeah, let's quickly um, change the screens. And then I go on. I saw some, uh, David, can you give me the screen, please? Yeah, thank you. So I saw some questions um, and they are dealing with exactly, I, I'm, I'm not uh, sure if, that, if I can answer them uh, right now, but they are dealing with a question, what is the right step to um, introduce the exercises and uh, what about load progression? Um, David will focus on that in the third part when he talks about monitoring and um, increasing the load stepwise. And uh, the th second thing I um, would like to, to point out and uh, uh, focus on is the, the quality thing, that quality about uh, over quantity is important. 
especially if we're talking about how we can transfer those ideas uh, that specialists have made in the return to handball in having those handball specific loads or Courtney asked what are mechanical loads. The mechanical loads in handball are the special movements like stopping, accelerating and all of this on our court and not um, uh, in the forest or wherever you run or do endurance training. That is so important that these are the mechanical loads. And as, as um, um, I learned in my coach's education, I'm sure you also did this. It's good to know to keep in mind that we have those load parameters like intensity, duration, extension and load density, which is important to uh, do load control, to manage loads. Um, but it's not that easy to transfer this to handball because handball is a chaotic situation. If we practice a three against three, we cannot say um, we have controlled situations or automated, automated situations. So we should also adapt the group size to our load parameters because group size impacts, impacts the relation between uh, the action and the post time uh, for the players. So as I said, um, to control or manage loads in handball specific training are not so easy in a normal practice because we have chaotic situations. And therefore, I want to focus on some things which might help in, in this period in June, July, if we are about to return, some things how we can control loads. And um, I want you to focus on if we isolate skills in certain handball specific exercises, then we are able to control loads and to manage those loads. The second uh, thing is controlled or automated actions allow us to control loads as well, better than in situational actions. And if we as coaches are also able to realize and to think um, what impact the size of a sector or a court has on the exercise, that would be um, already the icing on the, on the cake if we're able to do that. And uh, in order to show this, how the size of a court impacts the intensity of an exercise or the mechanical loads, I prepared the following clip. It's a cop and gangster game. And um, there we have five air bodies on the court. I'll start, start the video in a second. Um, so there are five air bodies. And uh, whenever you touch an air body, you cannot be caught by the cop and he has to go on chasing others. Uh, but there's only one player allowed to touch the air body. If a second one is coming, uh, the first one has to leave. And just keep in mind what the difference of the exercise would be if we did it on a full court. So, and now I will start it so that you get an impression. So if we did this exercise on a full court, we would have longer sprints, we would have a, a, a longer duration of running, but the, uh, the mechanical loads of stop, stopping and accelerating would be less. So keep in mind that the, uh, the sector also influences load control. So um, with the following clips, um, we want to show how you could isolate uh, um, different skills in order to control loads after the returning to play. And what is important to me is, please keep in mind that not the exercise is important itself, but how we can isolate some skills to realize that load control, to do a good progression by uh, uh, we recommend 10% every week um, of, of progression 
Um, and in order to realize that, uh, we have to isolate this. And uh, this load control is so difficult for us coaches in a normal handball practice. So let us look on how this could look like in a bouncing exercise with change of direction and change of rhythm. You see, this is an automated exercise, a controlled exercise. The players know when to change direction. And so the impact is really low. In the second step of the progression, uh, they know when to change direction, but now they have to accelerate a higher impact. These are mechanical loads accelerating, but in a controlled situation. And this exercise shows what David means by uh, preparing for chaos. In a game, you never know when to stop, when to accelerate. And here we see uh, the highest impact of loads because it's not a controlled situation. How could this look like in a passing and catching exercise? Or in exercises? Take care of the progression. Yep. Okay, in the first step, the players prepare the catching, the receiving of the ball by those offense moves, accelerating, back paddling, and accelerating in a forward movement again, and then they pass the ball on to the next player. The second step, here we have basic movements of defense like side steps and a block. And keep in mind that this exercise is isolated in its skill so that we can do load control by group size, duration of the exercise, or let's say 20 jumps for every play. Whatever. <laughs> Now the players are doing an, an exercise in a group of two with a movement preparing the receiving of the ball. And what you can see here, um, the group size is um, decreased and so they have less time between the repetitions. Here we added the progression of a crossing. And so we have little cuts as well in the groups of two. And the players still have to do an exercise in advance before they receive the ball at the air bodies. So a good example for progression, um, but still an isolated exercise to control the loads. How could we isolate some skills in the goalkeeper warm up, for example, with coordination exercises or ballistic loads or plyometrics? See this example done with the girls' team. Jawohl. Und jetzt. Gut. Super.
So again, handball specific moves, stopping, back paddling, change of direction, accelerating, receiving the ball. So it's a complex, but still an isolated exercise. Now we see ballistic loads, plyometrics. You can easily imagine you could also do this exercise with uh, jumps on one leg and so on. So there is a progression possible still. Um, we move on to uh, almost the last clip in this second part. Um, now left back and left wing or right back and right wing are playing together um, in a more yeah, tactic, tactical exercise. The first exercise you can see here, it's a combination of a passing and a running feint. Passing and running feint combined. And this gives us the opportunity for handball coaches also to concentrate on quality. And at the same time, the players have stopping and accelerating movements in a handball specific exercise on the court. Here the progression is from a controlled exercise to a chaos exercise, preparing for chaos as David said. Here the defender comes into the game. And left back has to decide whether he plays a quick pass back to left wing or if he plays on to the center back. And so the right wing defender has to decide whether he has to stop or go back. And so this is not a controlled exercise anymore, but a situational exercise. So, um, I told you I'm also keen about uh, basketball and one of the, the greatest players, Kobe Bryant, once said about defense, arms are weapons and the rest is step work. And that is why we have to prepare our players in, in their long-term player development for those specific needs, for those loads and for the technique as well. So it needs to be specific for our sports, but our training should reflect the needs and demands of the competition. So one last uh, suggestion for um, an isolated exercise where we could control loads by time or duration, but um, it is more fun because it's a game. It's not only reduced on technique or tactical. Here we have two small games, which I want to show you. The first one is related to volleyball and the second is a relation to maybe table tennis. Every player has three contacts to get the ball over the net. And after the ball has crossed the net, he has to get back and sprint around one air body. So we have accelerations and stops on a small court. And believe me, those exercises are not only demanding, but quite fun for the players as well. And these are also chaotic situations, but we could control the loads, as I said, about duration or repetitions, maybe. So thank you for your attention in this part where we made suggestions for how we could return in the athletic parts, preparing and reducing injury risks, and how to transfer this in handball situations. Courtney.
Okay, we have a lot of questions coming in now. Um, I'll try to take them a bit chronologically. We have, first people are asking about this first stage. So David, can you tell us a bit about the methods you would use to test fitness when the players are, you're first seeing the players again? And maybe with some, also some, uh, because you obviously might have some great methods in the German Federation, but maybe also some basic methods that can be applied in a broader context also? Yes, um, all right. I, I think there, um, there are many methods to, to test uh, what the player's uh, physical situation is when you, when you start um, playing handball again on, on, on court. Um, first of all, I would did an uh, um, endurance test. Um, this is very simple. You can do shuttle tests um, to, to see how their general endurance uh, is, or this is quite a, a kind of, of specific endurance if you do shuttle tests. So uh, you can do also uh, um, 505 tests. This is a um, change of direction test where you can see how your players react to that. And when you see they're really slow, when you have values from, from testing before and you see they're really slow, you know you have to work on that and, and you cannot uh, start uh, the training or the, the change of direction training as usual. Uh, testing strength is also a really good indicator. Um, if you have the, the, the possibility to do it in a, in a gym, uh, of course, with external loads. If not, if you if you handling or if you training with with younger kids, you can do it over a repetition method. Uh, you you let them do uh, certain repetitions of squatting or um, push ups. Uh, you can also do some more specific tests with the um, running aids with the ball. Th there is really quite a lot what what you can do before you start. And and I would. I would do it if you have the opportunity to do it because you have to have an overview over the, the player's uh, physical state. And this is a point that I will mention later in, in, in the next part. Okay. Um, and then people have asked more about this time of physical preparation before getting back to the court and being reunited with the ball. Uh, can you talk a bit about this? How? Is there some sort of rough time you would give this or do players return to the court at the same time they start to do physical? I, I would start, um, in, in every case, I would start before I get back to the, to the court. So when we, when we have the situation now that most of the players do strength and endurance training, uh, general strength and endurance training, I would implement it there. I, for example, we, we give uh, recommendations to our player that, that when they do a strength training, they use uh, 15 minutes of, of their time spending with uh, jumping, with change of directions, with some working with the, with the ball. So they implement it even they are not on the court and they have not that specific mechanical loads like they have on the, on the court ground, but they are quite going into that direction. So they, they have... Um, almost specific loads, uh, which we are implementing in, in their training routines. If they go three, four, five times a week uh, running or, or doing strength training, uh, try to, to bring it there. The examples that you saw in, in the videos, the exercise that you saw in the videos, uh, you can implement it there, uh, a part of that. And, and um, therefore you, you preparing then player for getting back to court. Okay, and we have also people asking about young players. Um, someone's asked for as young as six years old. I might be interested to hear from both of you for this because maybe Jochen, I don't know if when the players are younger, is there less focus on the physical preparation and then the role of on-court coach comes more into play? Um, I don't think it's... it's um, um we have even a greater responsibility, let's, let's uh, say it this way, uh, for children of this age, but uh, we need to, uh, uh, I do not know the right word to hide it or to, to uh, we have to uh, put it into exercises that are more fun, but we have to keep in mind that we have to uh, prepare them for this, but this would 
would also be done in a normal uh, practice with uh, um, kids of six years age, uh, six years of age, that uh, we take care of, of the loads we, we uh, put on them and we have to take care uh, that it's uh, still fun for them. But I would not say that it's uh, um, a completely different approach. Okay. Do, would you recommend fitness training with young children like this, David? Um, yeah, you, you, you know, fitness training, you have a kind of, of picture of it when, when you're talking about that everybody is taking the picture of lifting weights and, and doing things like that. But I think you can start uh, fitness training uh, with, with six or 10 year old kids. That's, that's no problem. They can use their own body weight. Even sometimes the, the own body weight can, can be quite challenging and quite a, a, a really a lot of, of, of load. So mm -hmm. um, yes, it, I think it's, it's um, necessary to, to work with kids on that, on, on their fitness, even for a long time uh, athletic development because they will face uh, later um, strength training in gym. So, and let's prepare them at a young stage and don't be um, feared of, of, of uh, doing a little bit more uh, with them. The, the highest loads they, and the highest forces they have when they play handball. Mm -hmm. we, we saw the forces before. Uh, you cannot uh, um, imitate that in the gym. So we don't have to be feared that they get injured in the gym mm -hmm. when they have a good supervision. Uh, so when there is a, a qualified uh, a teacher or qualified athletic trainer, doing that with the, with the kids. Maybe, maybe I could add one point only. It's the complete uh, similar approach to what we do in handball. We come from general exercises to more specific ones. And a fitness level for uh, children six years old could be yeah, like gymnastics, uh, what they do in their free time as well. It should, it should reflect what they are doing in their free time, like climbing, um, mm -hmm. uh, doing gymnastics. And then it gets uh, more specific uh, as they grow and it's the same approach as we uh, follow in handball that they are fun with playing at the beginning and that we teach more and more specific technical or tactical skills uh, uh, when they grow older. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we'll leave that there and if you want to continue and we'll come back for more later. Right, so I think it's my part now. Um, I will quick share my slides. Uh, one second. Okay, so we are moving forward to the third part, to the um, yeah, to the future. Let's say the future. Um, and there are some supporting means I want to talk about. Um, okay. So we had these nice uh, slides mentioned before. Uh, this is a nice diagram though, but is it realistic? So um, in, in the best case, we want a stepwise increase of loads uh, as we said before. And um, Jochen also mentioned it. Um, there is a um, best case would be a 10% uh, rise up week by week. This is uh, what scientific papers recommend. Uh, yeah, it's, it sounds good, but how much is this 10%? How, how we can quantify this? So we need to quantify it if we want to control loads. We are talking a lot about loads and uh, how to, to, to stepwise raise loads, etc. cetera. But uh, we need to quantify them. Otherwise we cannot control it. So therefore, uh, in my opinion, uh, we need a monitoring. So what is monitoring? Um, you can uh, monitor volume, you can monitor uh, external loads, internal loads. Uh, you can uh, see how the players are performing or how are they are feeling. This is monitoring. You just uh, wanna have an overview of the performance and also of the, of the state, of the general state uh, of, of your players. So in monitoring, uh, it can be very simple. This is sometimes the, the thoughts that monitoring is just for, for top clubs or for really professional people. Uh, but in, in, in fact, everyone can do it. It's, it's really simple. And uh, 
yeah, of course you can use the latest software on, on the market if you are an organization or a top club, but if you don't have this financial capacities, you, you can do it yourself with, with Excel there. Um, it's really not rocket science. There are a lot of tutorials online uh, where you can see how it, how it uh, looks. Um, so for us national coaches, it's a really, really good tool, especially in this time. It's a, it's a way to overcome distance and stay informed about the player's condition. And um, yeah, especially in this time, as I, as I said, it's, it's really, uh, really important. So um, yeah, as mentioned before, you can use external loads. Uh, you can use internal loads. Uh, best, of, of, uh, best is to use both. Um, there are kind of different wearables, of course, that you can use. Uh, there are systems like uh, GPS, LPS, uh, for the top clubs, maybe blood values. Uh, it's depending on how much you want to spend. But you know what? Sometimes keeping it simple does also work. So subjective self-reported measures trump uh, objective measures. So this is a good review that, that you can have a look at. Um, so, and then I will show you in the next slides how we do the monitoring with our youth teams and junior teams. And we start with the internal load. Um, in this example, you see here uh, the curve. This is the chronic, uh, acute to chronic workload ratio. You compare the current week with the last 28 days. So and then you get an index, and this should be between 0 0.8 and 1.3. This is the so-called sweet spot. Tim J. Gavitt uh, is the, the scientist that did a lot of re uh, research on that. Um, of course, there are some, some critics about that, but it's, I think it, it's a good standpoint. It's a good starting point to really... Um, to really monitor the loads. So in this curve, you see um, with ongoing lockdown, the, the load tolerance goes down and down and down. Um, in the columns here in the, in the bottom of the, of the picture of the slide, you see uh, columns. They are um, uh, the subdivisions uh, of the um, of the perceived exertion, so it's it's um, it shows how hard the training was in that week for for the players. So you have here the, the green part. Let's say a, a quarter was in a not so hard, uh, not so demanding um, uh, phase, and up to then the, the yellow and the orange part was harder in, until it goes to totally exhausted and, and totally maximum hard training. Um, in this, you can see how the player, um, yeah, how the, how the player deals with, with the training loads that you give him. So how he, he feels about that. So this is the internal side. This is uh, good when you compare or when you uh, take it in addition with the external loads. Here you see time uh, for different categories. In these columns, we see the proportion of the training content uh, of the training content and the total volume of the last eight weeks. So yellow is handball training. You see uh, here, this is the, the time we get slightly back to, to handball. Here before we, we had nothing. We had a little bit of uh, strength training and regeneration, that's green. Uh, when you move on to week 22, you see there is more handball training in it, but the, um, the proportions or the parts of handball training comparing to strength training, there's a lot more of strength training this guy did in the last week or in the last weeks, but even with a really good increasing of the loads, so this, almost should be 10% week by week, except uh, week 25 to week 26. But you see, you have an overview over the loads that we are talking about all the time. And on this basis, you can do um, the, the monitoring or the recommendations for, for training or your training schedule 
um, is adapted by that. So we move on to the next chart, uh, to the next slide. So we, here we see the last six months, and this is really interesting because you have here February, um, the first column. You see this is a, a big part is handball training and then followed by uh, strength training and other contents. And then by the mid of March, we have the lockdown. So in this case of this guy here, he raises up uh, strength training. We see it also here, the handball training, when you, when you look at the February, uh, drops down in March uh, by a half, by, or almost a half. And in April and in May, it was really comparing to that before, quite nothing. You have uh, starting end of May with handball, a uh, little bit, so he had six hours in the whole month handball training. It was, uh, I think, um, autonomous training uh, or even one or two, two sessions with the team. But, you know, you see very well the proportions and you know how to give recommendations or how to, to design your training when you start again with uh, handball training. So you, you know what your player did before. All right, so um, my, in my last slide, um, I wanna just um, show you what, what we did now in, in, this, uh, in this time and, and what we are planning for, uh, for the future. Uh, because of the, the lockdown and the, the more on, on um, video chatting that we did in that time, we use it very well and, and had uh, video meetings with specialists and, and with uh, athletic and SNC coaches from the clubs. And we did questionnaires and, and they reported us um, the situations in the clubs and the situations of our national players. And uh, based on that, uh, and this will answer the, the question before with the testings, um, we've, yeah, we figure out that it's really necessary to, to know what is the the actual physical state of our players. So uh, we organized testing opportunities at the Olympic basis at a really early stage. So every club it was a was a um, yeah support for the clubs and uh, for their first teams for the youth teams or youth national players. Uh, there were um, yeah they had to go to this to this uh, testing. So and. Um, when we see what the physical state is of them, um, how the, the difference between the players is, we better can give recommendations to the, the clubs or for us, it's very important when we're planning um, some, some uh, events with the, with the teams. And yeah, at least uh, we hope to return to handball with, with as little interference from the pandemic as possible. So, my last slide and I like to say thank you and pass the floor to Jochen. Okay, so as David just said, we are about to finish uh, our presentation. And um, in the beginning we said we divided the three parts in the past, the present, present and the future. David just spoke about the supporting means and um, we also made thoughts about what is about the COVID-19 leftovers uh, in the hope that handball is about to return to the courts. Um, and I think it's all also worth thinking about um, what, should, uh, should, what should we take into the future as well from, from this time. And first of all, cooperation and solidarity uh, in the society among the players uh, within a team are basic virtues for a team. So uh, this should be definitely something um, uh, we should uh, build up the next phase on in the future. Self-discipline and creativity and so on. Many other uh, things maybe on this list. Uh, I think this uh, differs from uh, country to country and uh, continent to continent maybe, but I think there are still a few things um, that are worth uh, taking over uh, into the future. It's not everything um, that uh, is, is bad. 
Another thing is that we're closer together in the cooperation of specialists, maybe that we understand each other better, better about our needs or demands in order to develop the players, in order to de develop this great sport. And in, also in order to share our uh, uh, findings uh, with others to help each other uh, among uh, the, the nations, the continents. And uh, this is also something we should consider um, and what we think to be important. Uh, before we finish our presentation, we just want to share um, one thought as well, um, which is a, a pyramid of success originally called by Rolf Brack, a famous German handball coach. I modified it and said it's a pyramid of development or preparation as well. And this pyramid, um, this pyramid's aim is being successful. And you can define successful in different ways. It's not only about winning medals, it's also uh, about developing players, especially when you're dealing with kids and young players. So, but the thing is you can only realize development or success in a competition. A competition has certain demands uh, based on statistics or tactical trends or uh, whatever. David also told you about demands uh, on a physical level on the players. So success or development can only be reached in a competition where you can see has, has your player developed. So this is a certain stage. And at the basic level, we have the performance level. Um, on the performance level, you find our players and their skills, their abilities. We have the general conditions in our gym, in our club, with our means we have available. And um, we can therefore say the competition is somehow the set point. We're uh, aiming to develop our players to be able to compete in this competition. And on the performance level, we find the actual value. We have to do tests to find out, um, do our players uh, can adapt to these demands and what is their actual value at the moment. And in between, we have a, a level, we have a um, um, stage which can help to develop the performance level up to the competition level. And sometimes there is a clash between uh, these two levels uh, if there is a great distance. And this uh, uh, level is called training. And this is the job of us coaches um, independently if, if we are athletic coaches or handball coaches. Our job is to close that gap. Our job is to develop our players, to develop that sport. And this is uh, sometimes a hard task. Uh, we know that as well, and we showed some things. Load control in athletic is different than a load control or management in handball, but it's not about doing this in a, a perfect way. It's about aiming at the best, that, that is our opinion, because uh, things that are worth being done, like developing our players, developing our sports, are still worth being done, even if you don't reach perfection. I think this is uh, really important and th this is the, the, the gist of this presentation, you could say, um, that we, we just should aim to close that gap between the actual value and the set point. And then before I close our presentation, it's important for us to say that we are lucky in Germany that we are hopefully about returning uh, to, to handball and returning to the court. But we know that this, this is not the case in every country at the moment uh, in this world. So uh, let me say that we um, um, really feel grief with uh, uh, those who suffer and that our thoughts are still with you. Um, and I hope that uh, uh, together we have the same aim that we can celebrate our great sport at different events on different occasions, uh, maybe at the uh, junior world championships or hopefully um, at last in January with the next world championships where uh, the handful community is going to meet. So at the end of our presentation, let me say thank you to all the translators, um, to you for watching and also for Co uh, Courtney hosting uh, this presentation. 
thank you so much and all the best uh, to you uh, around the globe. Okay, uh, we do have a few questions. So um, these are a bit more general. First, I'll ask Joachim, maybe you can give us some insight here about maintaining on-court skills while alone at home for those people who are still in this situation. Um, first of all, I, I could uh, recommend uh, the, the video clips we uh, provided because it was um, thinking in a creative way, how could we maintain this? Some parents might have gone crazy in Germany because their kids were practicing bouncing uh, in the living room. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but we, we try to focus different um, locations like uh, on the courtyard, on the porch, and uh, it's, it's worth doing them in a different intensity. You cannot throw as hard as in, in a gym, but I think for, for the, the brain, um, having the same exercises is, is as well a good impact just to be in, in to recognize, to remind the motorical skills, and it's not only about throwing as hard as you would do in, in a gym. So it's it's worth, even if we sometimes think that that has no impact, at least it helps to decrease the speed of losing your your level. And, and uh, let me add this, Courtney, um, we have made so great uh, experiences with players being uh, uh, thankful or appreciating that they are uh, being taken care of. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, David, can you talk, we have some questions about having a short period to get ready to return to the court. Can you tell us a bit about that if you don't have so long to build up your return? Um, <clears throat> yeah, of course. Um, I, I saw that question also, this was about that, that seven weeks of preparation. Um, I think I mentioned before um, with that keep in, mi keep in mind slide that um, the, um, we don't have to catch up uh, what we lost um, through the, the lockdown phase. So it's uh, not sensible to, to bring more training or more intensity into the training. Um, even when you start the, the, the competition phase or the league, you still developing. So it's, I, I wouldn't risk to, to take uh, an injury for, uh, for a player uh, by doing more to catching up. I would do the same what I did before. I, I would be even more, uh, um, um, I would even have more focus on, on quality and um, bring the preparation into the competition phase. So you're even developing there. Right. Um, okay, now we just have a couple more general questions before we go. Oh, sorry, did Jochen, did you want to say something? No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so someone asked about the working together, uh, like the on-court coach and the strength and conditioning coach. Can you talk a bit about this, how, how you collaborate? Me first, David? <laughs> yes, why not? You start and I add. Okay. Um, I think, uh, um, yeah, the, the basis is, is trusting each other and that, that is why we, why we uh, work together. And I think it also has more to do with uh, our uh, self-image as a coach um, than um, yeah, it has to do with our self-image. We do not have to uh, know everything. It's about perfection as well. Um, but we uh, need to know that there are others uh, might be able to help us. And we have to moderate sometimes uh, this process of taking into account what a specialist says, uh, but also telling the specialist maybe, uh, I do not have uh, that much time. Could you adapt your tr uh, training schedule for the players because we only have four weeks un until the next match or whatever. Um, but uh, um, yeah, talking and telling the other one about the special needs of your, uh, of your job. And maybe uh, David also uh, told, tells me or told us uh, that he needs 
at least 20 minutes uh, per, per practice. And then I sh should adapt. Maybe I can uh, include athletic exercises in my uh, goalkeeper warm up so that we have uh, um, the, the time used wisely, as David uh, said in, in his uh, first slides. And after he realized that this is possible, maybe uh, including some um, athletic exercises um, in combination with, with handball exercises, then we are able to give the players a greater support and to save time for them as well. So our self-image is important, but our goal should be the same one, developing the player. And yeah, mm -hmm. this is how it looked like in, in roughly spoken. Do you have in addition to that, uh, very quick, um, I, I think the communication is, is one of the key points that, that we have a good communication. I, I asked Jochen, for example, uh, what, does he, what does he see with, with, her, uh, with his players? Uh, does he see some, some deficits in, in quickness or general deficits or whatever? Uh, I, I try to, to, to see that also and, and find a solution in, in, in terms of, of athletic preparation or athletic training, strength training, whatever. And uh, this is what, what the, the connection of, of both make, uh, make really worthful. Okay, uh, we'll just do one last question before we go. And this is quite more general, but I think this is interesting for you to share some information on, David. It's about, someone asked about players complaining about shoulder pain. This was from early when you were talking about these exercises. Um, I think this is more focused on not a player returning from a serious injury, but a player who is training normally and everything, but has some pain. Do you have some recommendations for this? What is the key? Is it, are there just more of these exercises you've shown or maybe every case is different. So this is difficult to comment on. But. Um, first of all, I think it, this will be the case with, with many players that they start now and, and they say, wow, my shoulder is, is hurting a lot. Um, this is even the message that, that we want to bring here, uh, not too much too early. So in, in this case, it, it was too much too early. So otherwise he wouldn't have the, the, the pain in the shoulder. So my recommendation at this point was uh, a deload of, of throwing actions. You don't have to necessarily quit uh, the, the throwing. I, I, I don't know what, what, he ha what he has. When he has an injury, of course he has to stop throwing. But I'm, I'm thinking now that it's when, when it's just an um, overuse yep. or uh, too much at this point, uh, deload, let him do more isolated things, let him do more of the preparation exercises, less throwing. If you can quantify the throws, then uh, go back to, to the half or to a quarter of that, what, what he did before and uh, just look how, it's, um, how he, he feels then. And if he can progress step-by-step maybe 10% by each week <laughs> would be a recommendation. But uh, at first deload, of, of course, yes. Okay. okay, well, thank you to you both. This was all very interesting. I hope that everyone has found this very informative. Um, we will need to wrap up because we have another lecture starting at three o'clock. And uh, I hope everyone will be able to join us for the next lecture. Uh, this is from the IHF health and fitness team for referees. It will be focused on physical and mental preparation and also nutrition. So various aspects of kind of overall health are covered and there is a slight refereeing standpoint, but this is going to be relevant for all people, just like every lecture in this, in this symposium. So thank you very much again to Jochen and David, and I hope we'll see everyone at three o'clock. Thanks, Thank Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.